All right. Well, welcome this morning. We'll let uh, some people be straggling in, I'm sure, over the next five, ten minutes. Uh, my name is Professor, Professor Daniel Dean, Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Concordia University, Irvine. And I, to this morning, we're going to do something slightly, I mean, I, actually, let me just make some, some, a, a quick comment about uh, Faith Lutheran and, and these kind of summer series, which I, I'm really enjoying in terms of kind of stepping outside of the traditional uh, theological Bible study and kind of exploring what, uh, you know, our, our professors uh, up at the, at the university up north, a little ways from us, uh, uh, are doing in terms of thinking about Christianity and culture. And I think this is really neat that you could actually have a philosopher come on a Sunday morning and do a, a talk. In most places, this would be anathema. <laughs> and I would probably run out and stoned. Um, but, but here, I, I can do it, so it's fun, and I enjoy this, and this is great. Uh, and, and it's great because you get a different kind of perspective of the kinds of issues that we're dealing with as professors at the university. Uh, and it's not just an academic enterprise, because really, we're the, safe, we're the ones who have the safe job. Because we sit at the university, we talk with students, and we think about these things, but you guys are the ones that are actually in the trenches, the day in and day out, working with what we might call the other, or the heathen, or the one who needs talking to, right? I mean, look, I, my job, I, I sit, and I'm, I, I'm in a university office, and I think. I tell my students this all the time, it's the best job in the world. All I do is sit and think. <laughs> you guys have to do stuff, and if our job as professors aren't helping equip you to have these kinds of discussions in the public sphere, then we are failing. So I really in, uh, enjoy this opportunity to come down and, and speak to you here at, at Faith, which is my home congregation. I've been here for a long while. Um, and on that note, let me just kind of introduce the topic that I'll be discussing today. So I was told by Dan Van Voorhis that if I need it, I could have another week. So this might extend into two. Because philosophy can get kind of, or I'm going to try to keep it, uh, I don't want, it's not an academic lecture, but I have a tendency to get academic. So what I'm going to, what, we're going to work through it slowly, uh, but I'm, this might, I'm going to cut it at roughly, I was told that 9.15 is the hard cut. I might, or, or 10.15, uh, I might cut it a little bit before then and just have some chance to open up and, and have you reflect on what, what I've said in terms of maybe, do you want me to back up, talk about the, something again that we kind of skipped over or something like that? Just give it, give it some time to discuss what I'm going to present today, and then we'll continue on uh, next week. So my goals, the title of my talk is The Ethics of Belief, uh, Virtue and Apologetics. And we've been kind of even hearing this word virtue pop up over the last couple of weeks. We, it's, a, it's, a, it's a term that's, that's really kind of caught fire in, in the last maybe five to 10 years uh, uh, in terms of, or uh, longer than that, last 50 years in academic philosophy. Um, and so what we're going to try to do, and what a couple of us at the university are trying to do, is try to figure out how does this term relate to Christ and culture and, and Lutheranism in particular. And so I want to investigate this idea of what this ethics of belief might be, uh, and we'll talk about what that is, in relation to this, this idea of virtue, and then what our probably primary function as Christians in society ought to be, presenting or defending the gospel in the public sphere, and that would be the apologetics. So my goals for this, kind, this discussion today uh, are to understand what this ethics of belief uh, is, which has to do with exploring this link between ethics and epistemology, and we'll, we'll discuss those terms shortly. Secondly, virtue, explore how virtue may help overcome some problems within an ethics of belief. And then lastly, the apologetic task, how might, I'm trying to see how this is working on here. Okay, uh, good, it's showing up. How might we explore how the ethics of belief and virtue relate to our apologetic enterprise? And that's the goals. So before we get into all of this, let's do a little setup on this. What exactly is the ethics of belief? Well, belief is a funny thing. Beliefs are funny things. Uh, we have them. They're all over the place. They're weird in the sense that sometimes you don't even control having them. The second I popped that picture up on the, on the screen, you formed a belief about a cat on a mat. It just happened. I can do it to you again. Do not, whatever you, whatever you try to do, do not think of a pink elephant. It's too late. You already thought about it, right? It, 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 they, 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 they impinge upon us, right? So this is interesting, but what are these things? What are, what are the beliefs that we just have to deal with every day and that we sometimes aren't, are even outside of our control? 
Well, the philosophers have, have described beliefs in, kind of, in numerous ways, but one that's kind of popular right now is to think of belief as a kind of pro-attitude. It's an attitude towards something, a proposition, or a state of affairs. Now that's, okay, more weird language. What do you, what do you mean a pro-attitude toward a proposition? Well, propositions are these things that are, they're, whether they're in the world or out, we don't know what, what, there's debate on what a proposition entails philosophically, but they tend to be those meanings or the contents of our declarative statements. So we have a picture of a cat on a mat. I believe that that's a picture of a cat on a mat. It's a belief that I have. It's a belief that all of us have right now. When I state that, I believe that the cat is on the mat, I'm actually declaring my, uh, 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 an attitude toward you. And that attitude uh, is either tracking something that's true or false, depending on whether or not there's an actual state of affairs in the world about a cat on a mat. So we share these kind of this attitude. I believe, you believe that there's a cat on the mat, at least according in this situation with that, with that, with that uh, picture up there. Now, why is a proposition different than from just the, ling the, the statement that I make, I believe in a cat on the mat? Well, because there's numerous ways that we can capture the proposition re representing a cat on a mat. I said, this is getting, this is already, we're already way <laughs> deep uh, in terms of philosophy and we, we'll, we'll push forward. But th think about this. There's numerous ways to state that there's a cat on the mat in many different languages. And so we can state that uh, according, you know, I mean, uh, the one that I'm most familiar with, uh, el gato está sobre el, al, uh, uh, <laughs> la alfombra, right? And actually that's thanks to Google Translator. Um, for, our, for our Latin friends, catum in grabato, and I say it with my Spanish uh, uh, inflections. Um, but there's different statements that all are true dependent upon this state of affairs holding. Now those English statements aren't the same statements because they're in different languages. But what they're capturing is this proposition that there is something about this world that entails a cat being on a mat. And thus they're true, all of them, true statements, even though they're coming from different contexts, different languages. All right, so, so, so our beliefs are what we use to declare what we propositionally hold. I believe in many things. I believe in a God. I believe that it's sunny outside. I believe I'm standing here right now giving a, a discussion about beliefs to you. All right. So these, the only way you, I can let you into my world of belief is to declare them. And we do that through propositional attitudes. Uh, now, propositional attitudes are much larger than beliefs. They also include wants, needs, desires, hopes, fears. You know, any, basically, the way to identify a propositional attitude is it's I something that. I believe that. I desire that. I want that. And that that indicates that you're talking about a, 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 an attitude you have towards something outside of you. Towards something outside of you. Okay. So now this is, again, mumbo jumbo jargon about the nature of belief uh, it, it, within philosophy. But what this entails is that we want to get clear about how we form or manage these beliefs. Because I think it would, be, it would be clear that some beliefs simply aren't worth holding. And remember, I, I already mentioned that there are beliefs, that the beliefs kind of impinge them, they, they, they force themselves upon us. You can't stop them from forming, some of them. So, the, so there's an issue here about what do we do with these beliefs that we have? What do we do with these beliefs that we, uh, that we need to either maintain or jettison or, 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 uh, or as Descartes called uh, this, this was the great, this is the great uh, problem of philosophy. I want to limit my number of false beliefs and increase my number of true beliefs. That's the game of philosophy. Now this requires though that we need some way to manage these beliefs. And this is where we move from beliefs into ethics. Notice in the, the phrase, the ethics of belief, what we have is we have ethics being the kind of uh, 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 the noun and belief being the modifier. It's an ethics of belief. So there's something more fundamental than the belief themselves. It's this thing called ethics. Ethics. So what does ethics deal with? Well, Plato captured this, and this is his, the, the, the front page of his, uh, uh, the Republic there. 
Plato captured this in terms of thinking that the, the idea of ethics is the most fundamental question of philosophy. And he captured it this way through the mouth of Socrates. We are discussing no small matter, but how we ought to live. How we ought to live. Now that word, uh, ought, is a kind of funny word. We tend to use this word uh, very colloquially in terms of saying, you know, well, this is like the, you know, the mother uh, or the father to his son. You know, mom's coming home. You ought to clean your room, right? Now that's kind of suggestive, right? You don't have to, and there's ways we can fake it, uh, but you ought to clean it. Now, that's a lighter sense of this word ought than what the philosopher is entailing when they talk about how we ought to live. Ought for the philosopher, in a kind of more in a moral sense, in its ethical sense, it delineates obligation. It tells us what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. And this is Ten Commandments type thinking here, right? Thou ought not kill, murder. That's a, that's a normative uh, ethical guide for what it means to be a moral person, grounding kind of moral obligations. Now, we as Lutherans get very tense when we start hearing this kind of language for very good reason, but let's, let's move forward uh, a little bit here. One thing to notice about this idea of Socrates' phrase is how we ought to live is that this idea of living comes in many varieties, right? What do we do as people? Well, we, we think we are deeply moral or religious people, even if we're not good at it. But we're also people, we're, as Descartes says, think, we're thinking things, we're feeling things, we're economic creatures, we're creatures of habit. We have all these kinds of, uh, uh, of traits that bound, bind us up as being human. So how ought we to live is actually going to fragment into what aspect of life we're going to talk about. There are moral norms. There are epistemic, knowledge-based norms. What ought I to believe and how ought I to believe them? What warrants or justifies my belief? There are aesthetic norms. All right, what are aesthetic norms? Well, what are, what are the norms guiding the, the idea of beauty? What makes a painting beautiful or a song beautiful? I mean, we all deal with this because you listen, you know, depending on, on the, your age here, we look back 20 years and say, I can't believe what these kids are listening to, right? Uh, and I look forward and I say, I, I look further back because I can't believe what my parents listen to. And, you know, there's, this is, these, are, these are norms that are guiding our kind of aesthetic experience. So, so the norms are, 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 are fragmented. And what we have in the ethics of belief is this idea that we want to decipher what norms or obligations we have in terms of belief formation and maintenance. Assuming true belief is valuable, how ought we to structure our cognitive lives, our minds, such that we operate according to the norms which provide the best means to attain our epistemic aims or our aims about the world, our aims about knowing things about the world. And this is foundational to all thinking and living. So I just mentioned that the, these norms tend to fragment. Uh, and, and this is, this is, uh, this is going to be a, a major player in, in kind of my discussion as we move forward a little bit in terms of why it is that they fragmented and maybe why that's not such a great way to uh, investigate or think about the idea of normativity or an ethics of belief. But to get to see how even maybe uh, in its most recent past, in the kind of locus classicus of, of the ethics of belief, uh, we have this guy named W.K. Clifford. And he's, he's one that didn't necessarily separate out the epistemic norms from the moral norms. He brings them together. So he was an English mathematician and philosopher. Uh, you see that he died 1879, he died very early, but he was almost he was on the cusp of his 34th birthday. Uh, he made contributions to mathematical physics, including, now listen to this, including a geometric model of gravity. Now, that's pretty crazy because 25 years later, somebody very famous that you all know of, you've probably never heard of Clifford, but somebody that you all know of used Clifford to discover relativity and Einstein's conception of gravity. 
This was all being work that was done in the 19th century, thanks to people like W.K. Clifford. Now, most of us don't necessarily know about Clifford's mathematical past, unless you're uh, you know, Dr. Schulteis in the back, uh, who, who teaches math for a living. Um, but where most freshmen are going to come across Clifford is a little article that he wrote uh, in 1877 called The Ethics of Belief. Now, he was very concerned uh, about how we ought to govern and how, what the right way to, to come at our beliefs uh, uh, is. And, and he made no bones about it. This is not necessarily simply an epistemic enterprise. This isn't something that we, this isn't like doing science. I need to get the right method and my method's gonna produce in me the right beliefs. He thought this was a very serious moral problem. And what most freshmen know W.K. Clifford for is one, a story, and to a principle. And this is to get at the idea of what an ethics of belief might entail, at least in its kind of foundations here. So what is the story? Well, he tells us two stories. The first story is this. He says, imagine this. You're, 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 you're an English ship owner. And you've got some immigrants that want to that go to America. So you sell, you book your ship. I mean, you've got, you've got, you're overflowing with passengers. Now, before... Before you send the ship out to sea, you ought to go check it out. Is this thing seaworthy? Is this ship seaworthy? So you check it out and you, you've got some issues, you've got some problems. You notice that there's some things that need taken care of. However, you work yourself, you work your mind, your, 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 uh, your, your beliefs into such a, a frenzy that you think, you know, th this ship has made this journey numerous times before. These are just minor little kind of problems with the ship. Uh, uh, we'll, I'll take care of them when it gets back. So you send the ship out and it sinks mid-voyage. Now Clifford asks us, would you hold that person who sent the ship, who he was having doubts about whether or not it was seaworthy, morally responsible for the lives of the people that died, that, that went down with the boat. Is he morally responsible? Go ahead and yell it out. Yes or no? Yes. Okay, so Clifford thinks that for most of us, we're gonna say, of course, he is morally responsible. What made him morally responsible? His beliefs or his doubts about the ship, right? So it was his belief, it, it, he, said, he says, now think about it this way. Let's pretend, the same story, the ship doesn't sink. It makes it to America. Would that change our moral condemnation or approbation of, of uh, the ship owner? Would we still hold him morally suspect even though the ship didn't sink? Clifford's gonna say yes. He said, I think so. It, there's nothing really different about this case except in one, they got lucky and made it, right? And the other one, they got unlucky. And we don't like to have luck have anything to do with our kind of, you know, our moral standing. So, so Clifford says, this is interesting because what made that person morally reprehensible was not necessarily the action, or at least the, an action that we standardly think about in terms of moral thinking regarding, say, hurting somebody or causing harm. I mean, he did that ultimately. But what, what, what is more fundamental to his, his, his uh, uh, immorality was the beliefs that he formed. He, it was a cognitive activity. He, as some people like to say, disregarded certain evidence about his boat and sent it off anyways. Now that's the story. Here's the principle. So what Clifford does, he says, now because I think, and he's, and he, you know, he's a philosopher, so we don't like to necessarily go out and actually ask people like I just did. We just sit and think about it and say, well, this is what most people think. All right? Um, now, so Clifford didn't actually go out and ask people this. He just wrote the story, and a lot of people said, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, but he does think that most of us would agree with him that in the, there's not a lot of difference between the two cases in terms of, of holding that ship owner morally responsible. So he says this, this indicates a certain moral principle to us. And here's the principle. This is the second piece that most people uh, uh, remember Clifford for. It is wrong always, everywhere, and for anyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence. It is wrong always, everywhere, and for anyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence. So if you're holding beliefs that you don't have evidence for, you are being immoral. That was Clifford's statement. That's his principle. This isn't, not, not that you're just wrong thinking, 
I mean, look at how deep he's think, he thinks this goes. It's not that you're just wrong thinking. It's that you're actually an immoral person. Now that's that's some powerful stuff. I think there's a lot. I didn't I didn't trace it out here because this is uh, one way. This is this you're, you're, what you're experiencing with kind of Dr. Mallinson and 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 I in terms of some of our, our uh, uh, ruminations on virtue is you're, you're experiencing the kind of birth of a research program. I and mean, we're just getting into this stuff. So I haven't done all my all my due diligence yet on this. But I think there's a lot of really neat scriptural ref, uh, uh, resources here to talk about this idea of the belief being what is morally condemnating, uh, 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 establishing moral condemnation. Uh, for people. I, mean, I think there's a lot going on here. All that stuff about all the, the filth that comes out of the heart and all this stuff. I mean, that's, there's, some, there's some good things here, to, some connections to draw, but I'll hold those off for another day. So here's two points that, that kind of Clifford introduces into the conversation and why we look to him as kind of this, this, this first figure in talking about an ethics of belief. One, recall that, that what, what makes these people or what makes, say, somebody like the ship owner morally ir irresponsible is the fact that they had to work themselves into a frame of mind. They had to do that themselves. They did have a certain control over their cognitive environment, or we might say they had a certain control over their minds, what they believe and what they do not. And we can regard or disregard certain things, and depending on how we manage that tension, one can be held morally responsible. Now, secondly, that working of, well, I, I, we, I ran these together, but that working of the mind does have moral implications for us has moral implications. Okay, so, so, so great. So that's William James, you know, he's won the day. Uh, he, he, we, we end up getting a position out of, his, out of uh, uh, following from his tradition called evidentialism uh, in philosophy of religion. Um, but uh, he wasn't alone. People took umbrage with, with his claim. And one of the more famous ones was this guy named William James. So if you open up any kind of introductory to philosophy textbook, you're gonna get to a section where you have William James squared off with, or uh, uh, Clifford squared off with William James and they're just gonna butt heads. And the professors love to use these guys to, to, to pit each other against each other, uh, uh, to pit themselves against each other, uh, because they, they really do kind of come at different aspects of this idea of what it means to have, form, maintain our beliefs, the things that we hold true. So, so what is William James? Well, he was a, a philosopher and psychologist. Did mo spent most of his career at Harvard. He was part of the trifecta of American pragmatism in the early, early 20th century. I mean, if America has anything to to uh, uh, um, donate to the uh, history of philosophy, it is pragmatism. I mean, this is, this is our tradition. Not necessarily the tradition I'm swimming in, but this is the American tradition. Uh, it starts, it doesn't start, but the early founding father, Ch Charles Sander Peirce, uh, followed quickly by William James, and then ultimately kind of, uh, 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 you know, the, 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 the one everyone knows, John Dewey, right? Uh, and, and James defended religious belief. Father was, was a, probably, a, I'd imagine, a strict Calvinist, but of a Calvinist of some sort. And he defended, defended religious belief, but he defended it on not evidential grounds, the way, say, uh, 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 Clifford would, but on pragmatic or prudential grounds. Now, there's these other norms coming into play. So Clifford really pushes hard this idea of evidence. You don't believe anything unless you have sufficient evidence. James pushes a more pragmatic norm, or what I call a prudential norm, which has to do with living life well. What's going to make you happy? And, and your happiness guides a lot of the way you structure your life. There's reasons why you don't eat at certain restaurants. It's not just because you don't like the food. It's because it doesn't make you happy, right? And there's reasons why you do certain things. You go for walks in the morning or in the evening because these things make you laugh. And you structure your life around what makes you happy. So James says, look, the religious person, they might not have any evidence for their, their beliefs at all, but if it makes them happy and it's pragmatically uh, useful to them, then why not let them believe? They have a right to believe even upon insufficient evidence. Even on insufficient evidence. He called, uh, and I, I will butcher this, uh, but he called Clifford the enfant terrible. Terrible, right? <laughs> You know, this, 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 this outrageously shocking, embarrassing individual because he mandated such strict guidelines to what one can and cannot believe. He says, that, he says if we were to truly follow Clifford in his, his dictum, none of us would, ha would have uh, the means to believe anything. Because think about how many just beliefs that one carries around that we don't actually ever think about what evidence we have for it, right? 
So William James, he says, he realized that Clifford's principle and thus his moral stance was too stringent. We hold many beliefs for which we have not gained this sufficient evidence. And furthermore, James believes that there is an empirical fact here. When we look at the way people actually form beliefs, rarely does evidence come into the equation. Really, what's at root of forming our, our kind of uh, the beliefs that we hold is what he calls our passional nature. Right? So here we have an interesting division between our two thinkers on the ethics of belief. One is going to be very kind of rationalistic, what we might call reasonable. This would be W.K. Clifford. The other one's going to be much more uh, emotive, or as he likes to say in a nice fancy word uh, that doesn't exist, uh, passional. Right? So you got, you got reason and emotions playing two sides of this kind of uh, a normative coin in thinking about the ethics of belief. Now, for, for Clifford, he says this is, this is what he thinks his, his famous essay is called The Will to Believe. Uh, this was 1896. It was unfortunate that Clifford had died so young because these guys would have had, I think, I think they would have provided, because they did their, their philosophy kind of in the public sphere, uh, I think these two guys would have provided some very nice back and forth over this issue. But unfortunately, James carries the day because Clifford died, and he died too young. Uh, they, did, they would have overlapped. Uh, more had, the, had Clifford uh, not contracted tuberculosis. Um, here's what, here's what, what, what James says in The Will to Believe. He says, here's the, the, whole, the whole thesis of the essay. I mean an essay uh, in justification of faith, justification of faith, a defense of our right to adopt a believing attitude in religious matters in spite of the fact that our merely logical intellect may not have been coerced. So in spite of the fact that our minds intellectually cannot grab religious belief, we have a right to believe it. We have a right to believe it. And his famous then, this would be, if, if everyone remembers Clifford for a, a story and a, uh, a, a principle, here's what most people remember James, more, most freshmen remember James for. Uh, a belief is a genuine option when it is forced, living, and momentous. Right? So what does that mean? Well, a forced uh, a belief is a genuine option. So choice between belief, you have a genuine option. N evidence doesn't come in into this, this discussion at all. What does is the idea of a forced belief, meaning that you have to choose. It's live, meaning it's actually a live possibility for you. And thirdly, it's momentous. It has some kind of deep existential, uh, it hits you at some deep existential level. It hits you at, it hits you at the core of your being. Uh, now, what are his examples? He gives some really silly ones, like, like whether or not I take an umbrella outside. Uh, I, don't, I don't quite follow exactly what he was after there. Uh, but we could think about this in terms of well, what, is a forced, what is a forced choice between belief? Well, imagine you're walking outside and it starts downpouring, right? That environment forces you to make a certain belief or, or it causes you to form, I want to get out of the rain or I don't want to get out of the rain. I either keep going or I don't. But regardless of what you decide, which belief you go with, it's going to force you to make a belief either way. You probably don't want to make this, this choice in beliefs, but you have to. That's the idea of forced. A living, uh, he, he does have a nice thing to say about this. He says, look, th there's a difference between a live and a dead belief. A live belief is one that, we've, that usually given to us from our upbringing and our culture and things like that are ones that are actually uh, 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 options for us. For most of us, becoming uh, 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 Islamic is not a live option. It's not a live option for, for all, probably any of us. Now, becoming agnostic might be a bit more realistic, right? Yeah, I mean, I, maybe not in this room, because you guys are all good, pious Christians. But I mean, that, that for, for somebody who's been raised Christian, it, the, 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 li the more live option would be becoming an agnostic before jumping from Christianity into, into uh, uh, Islam, right? Because that's just not a live option. It's a dead option because of the way we've kind of been uh, uh, enculturated. And momentous obviously has to do with this idea that uh, it, it, it hits us deep. It hits us deeply. So obviously, um, you know, counting. Uh, here's here's one from kind of science research. You know, what do scientists do? Well, if I if I if I talk to a scientist and I say, well, look, uh, all your what do you do? He says, I count the blades of grass outside on the university lawn every day. That's a good scientific fact, and that's one that we can really actually validate and verify. He knows exactly how many blades of grass are outside on the university lawn. But do we really want our tax dollars going for that kind of research? No, because who cares, right? Now, if he's talking about cancer research, that's slightly more momentous. That hits us at a deeper level than simply going outside and counting uh, blades of grass 
I, they probably wouldn't say that. What they'd say today is, what I do is I uh, take some fruit flies, I, I cut them up, I jiggle them in a bottle, and then I count their genetic makeup. Uh, that would be the equivalent of the kind of uh, uh, um, grass counter. All right, so, so here's two points then to pull from Clifford, I'm sorry, from James, and we'll, then we're gonna, we're gonna move forward on this so we get out, we can at least start maybe getting into virtue. Uh, one thing to note about, about what Clifford says here, I'm just gonna read a couple quotes from him. He says this, passions or emotions are part of this deliberative procedure. So within the kind of classical philosophical tradition, reason is always set against emotion. James brings that right back in. He says, look, we got something going on where we as humans are both reasonable and emotional. Emotionable, it's not really a word. But uh, uh, we, we struggle with this, and this impacts the way we deliberate about the beliefs that we hold or maintain. So something about us, emotionally, is going to influence the beliefs we form. Our, he says this, our passional, nature not only, uh, our passional nature not only lawfully may, but must decide an option between propositions. Whenever it is a genuine option, that cannot, that cannot by its nature be decided on intellectual grounds. He's following uh, another famous philosopher here, David Hume, in, in saying things of that nature. Secondly, so Clifford and James are going to, are going to, to separate on this idea of what's going to ground uh, our beliefs, whether it be evidence or our emotions. However, they do kind of come together in this ethic idea and how we, how we manage or how we uh, uh, ought to go about in, uh, uh, believing. Because here's what, here's what uh, uh, James says. I live by the practical faith that we must go on experiencing and thinking over our experience, for only thus can our opinions grow more true. But to hold any one of them as if it never could be reinterpreted or corrigible, I believe to be a tremendously mistaken attitude. Okay. So James, you've just redeemed yourself a little bit. You might, you, might think that there, you, you might think there's more going on in terms of our belief formation with emotions than I'd like, but at least you're willing to say, look, everything, every belief that we have is revisable. Everything that we take to be true can be questioned and ought to be questioned. There's that funny ought word again. It's the only way for us to approach or to get at to, or as he says, grow our opinions more true. Now, th in this, he's really not that much different from Clifford because Clifford was really concerned after the truth and his idea was, I mean, we didn't, we didn't get into it in, the, in, this, in this talk, but the idea was with this principle, he would go then and show how all these religions, and he starts with, with Islam, but he moves to, to uh, uh, Buddhism. He uh, uh, probably more uh, um, politically leaves out Christianity, but it was implied. Uh, but he goes and he challenges the uh, one's authorities that they have, saying you don't have, you don't have sufficient evidence to make the claims you're making about life, love, happiness, or the good, the true, and the beautiful. In the classic philosophy, you just don't have it. Your beliefs break down at some point. Well, James is saying the same thing. Our beliefs break down at some point. And the only way to push forward is to have the courage to investigate what it is we believe and why we believe it. What it is we believe and why we believe it. Now, what this did, though, this discussion or this, this clash between James and Clifford, it did kind of polarize the way we think about the ethics of belief. Because even here in James, with Clifford, it's very clear. He thinks there's a moral issue at stake here. But already in James, what we're seeing is a slide away from discussion of what we would kind of consider traditional morality, what is the good, and am I, am I a moral person, to a discussion that's more based around simply talking about our beliefs, with no link back to what our moral, uh, how our beliefs might impact our moral status as humans. And James has already kind of diverted the conversation. He's trying, in a way, literally just trying to save religious belief. He's just trying to save it, making it okay for you. He's trying to carve out a, a piece of property for us to live on as Christians. And so he's not too concerned with the moral question. He just wants to give us, as he says, the right to believe in Christianity. Now this gets developed in, in, in you know, so if, if, if Clifford and his evidentialism, or Clifford and his, his principle of evidence uh, leads to the development of this, this, this idea called evidentialism, meaning we can't hold any beliefs without, uh, that don't have sufficient evidence, James 
develops what we might call a fideism. I mean, not James himself, and it would be wrong to call him a fideist. This is one who just takes, there, there can't be any evidence for our beliefs. We just take them on faith, right? Uh, James wouldn't say that. He wouldn't go that far. Uh, but, but philosophers of religion have taken James's discussion and pushed it into a more fideistic kind of understanding of Christianity. I can't give you any reasons for belief in Christianity. Just believe. We've all heard these kinds of things probably before. We actually, some, I mean, our pastors do a really great job of, 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 of putting this in context when they're preaching from the pulpit. Because in a way, this is what the scripture says. That's what the scripture says. So James uh, uh, carved a space out for people like Alvin Plantinga uh, uh, who, and, and people like uh, philosophers up at, at Biola University to really investigate what a reasonable Christianity might look like without having to provide evidence for Christianity. Two strands of thinking. So linking this back and then pushing forward to some of the conversations I think we've had in, in the past in, in this, this, this discussion uh, or in this, this Sunday school hour with uh, some of the stuff on postmodernity, what we see in this debate is really the kind of preludes, the preludes to postmodernity. Now, I, I chose this house, so this is an odd house, because this, it's really going to, to help exhibit the different kinds of norms that are, that are at stake. The problem of postmodernity, uh, as I think I understand it from conversations with some of my colleagues, really has to do with a loss of which authority and which norms do we follow at any given time. We find ourselves in a radically pluralistic society, a radically pluralistic uh, uh, a nation, and they're all bombarding us with different belief systems, different norms. So which ones, which ones do we go with? Well, there are traditionally, uh, and, and these, th these are just the tradition, traditional ones I pulled out, there's traditionally three. There's the epistemic, the prudential, and the moral. And we've already kind of discussed uh, these. You know, but we can, to see how all these different kinds of, of, of norms really kind of impinge upon us daily, if we think about this house, this is, I don't know where this is, I just found this on, on the internet, but it reminds me of some of the stuff that I used to see uh, at Florida State University when we drive out into the, uh, the swamp. Um, but, uh, oh, I can, I can look at it here, there it is. Um, so what, what you got is you, you got this house that looks like it's literally built on the water, it's built on the bayou, right? Now, how many of us would want to live there? This is, this is a tough one for, for you Southern California folk. Uh, there, there might be some, some, some Southern uh, 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 migrants who would love to go back to this. Um, you know, if you can read the sign on the, on the right, this is probably where they keep their, their airboat, and, and it says, uh, life is good, and it's got a gator uh, drinking some sort of beverage um, uh, and, and hanging out on his swamp. Now, epistemically, I want to know some things about this house, right? I want to know how this house is constructed. I want to know whether or not, uh, 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 what, what's going on in terms of whether this, this house is going to get flooded. There's certain things I need to know about this house. Now, I, I use this because this is far away from us, but we do the same thing here in California, right? Uh, there's a wonderful house that I see every day now. Well, not every day. I used to see it every day when I used to go to the beach, uh, driving down Crown Valley. Uh, the, the, the back of the, ho the house is sliding off into Crown Valley. They chose poorly or they did something to their, their hillside and, and they did something bad because their house is sliding into the street. Um, not a good thing. Epistemically, I want to know certain things about the place I choose to live. So, I, so I'm, I'm guiding myself by, by epistemic norms. But which ones? Do I go with James? I kind of like the location. I can fish off of my porch. I might get eaten, I will get eaten alive by mosquitoes, but I'm, and I might get eaten by uh, uh, an alligator, but at least I can fish. So I can work my, I, I, can, I can will to believe that I want to live there. Uh, or do we go with James and we start looking at the more evidence for why we ought to live there? Or prudentially, uh, this would be, I'm sorry, Clifford. Prudentially, I, again, I might like to live there. I love it. it. It's a great location. It's nature, right? I can be, I can be, uh, uh, this, is, this is my Walden Pond, all right? Um, but not all of us, and probably from Southern California, are looking at this going, no, this is not what's going to make me happy. This is not what's going to make me happy. And then morally, I have certain obligations about deciding to live here, right? Ought I, is this going to be someplace where I can have my toddlers running around? They are the right size for alligators, <laughs> right? I mean, they're, my, my dogs, my kids, everything could disappear in a flash living at that house. 
So I do have, and I have to structure myself according to certain moral norms about even just common day, everyday decisions about where I ought to live. And the epistemic, the potential, and the moral are, are working their way in there. Which ones do I go with? Well, here's where postmodernity really picks up steam because we usually in some way, shape, or form our norms to some sort of authority. And unfortunately, uh, what we have uh, in today's uh, uh, society is this pluralism of authorities themselves. So not only do we have a pluralism of normativity, what kind of norms ought I use to govern my decisions? Because hey, if, it's, if it makes you happy, go for it. But then I also got a, 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 plural, a plurality of authorities grounding those norms. And there we, we see the, the religious all the time on the back of cars. Uh, we got the political, the societal, or the cultural. This is the bully pulpit idea, right? Give me, a, give, me a pul give me a pulpit and I'll spew what I think the way things ought to go, right? Uh, and, and, and then ultimately nature, nature. Now I, I choose this one and I don't know if we can really make it out. The reason why I got this odd picture up here is this was a lecture given by Thomas Henry Huxley. This was a lecture given by Thomas Henry Huxley who was Dar Darwin's bulldog. And what I thought was so interesting about it is where he was giving this talk. Now, let me just give you, talk three, he's talk three, it's on natural history, and the talk he delivered this night, I've never seen this, I've never read it, dogs and their forefathers. Sounds riveting. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, with Huxley at the, at, the, at the helm, it probably was. He was a very good public speaker. But, but what I thought was fascinating about this is notice the school. He's not giving this talk to Oxford or Cambridge. He's giving it to the Royal School of Mines on a series devoted to lectures to working men. Lectures to working men. What Huxley was very good at was taking a certain scientific uh, uh, um, nature-driven uh, 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 authority structure and the norms that go with it and not talking with professors about it but taking it to what he called the working man. He was not giving lectures, lectures to Oxford or Cambridge. He was in the street giving lectures to all the people who were in the working class because he knew if he won them over, things would change because there's more of them than there are of the Oxfords and the Cambridge. So, so he was smart in this, and, and, and we see this, this, this style is still uh, alive and well today. When, I mean, the last talk I gave a while back on new atheism, this is, this is what the new atheists do. They're not debating, they're not talking with the, the, the professors. They're doing this very thing, not on a Sunday morning, probably a Friday night, and speaking to thousands of, of students and, and young working class people day in and day out. This is why you can't avoid these questions. They are coming, you know, if we can put it into that famous uh, now HBO special, winter is coming uh, and we need to be ready for it. So this is the preludes and then we've, we've Dr. Mallinson has previously talked about some, some various ways uh, that uh, uh, we need to, we can push forward. So this does put me, uh, that clock's right, right? So this puts me at, at roughly 10 minutes left. Now, this does also have a nice break because the next part of the discussion is going to put us into, into virtue. Um, so what I think I will do is, is stop because we've, we've hit a lot of st stuff. Uh, and I will just kind of open it up for 10, 15 minutes to, to, to any kinds of questions you might have about this thing called the ethics of, of belief uh, and, and the things we've talked about. And of course, I got the two professors in the background uh, <laughs> all ready to go. So this morning we heard about the Trinity <laughs> and we heard about believing and trying to wrap our minds around things and the virtue of we have to believe based on evidence. But I just heard Pastor Hodel say what he said. How are you not contradicting that? Okay. Why is it virtuous? To believe in the Trinity, and I mean this quite seriously, right, right, because right. It, without going into the Trinity, which we can't understand, as the pastor told us, why, what, I'm confused. <laughs> okay, so, so, right, so this is, this is essentially just the setup, right? This is the problem, and, and you can see that there's a tension here, uh, because we've got some norms guiding what we ought to believe. Uh, and, and why I'm, I'm interested in moving to virtue 
is, and this is kind of a, a sneak peek of, of things to come, the ancients did not necessarily draw a sharp distinction between, say, the epistemic and the moral. Unfortunately, the conversation in the ethics of belief, which is a conversation that you don't hear about anywhere outside of philosophy or religion, I think uh, uh, really it, the reason why we don't hear about it is because nobody talks about the ethics of belief anymore. They'll just talk about what norms guide belief. And then that puts us into these, these problems about, well, if it's just evidence, then how do I square that with what my pastor is saying on, on, on Sunday morning? Uh, or, if I'm William James, it doesn't really matter because even the things he's saying don't really matter as long as they make me feel good, right? So, so, so what do I do? And this is where I think the virtue is going to help us. Uh, and I think there's a lot of fruitful stuff, uh, fruitful ideas to mine here. Because what virtue, what the virtue ethicists or the virtue epistemologists or the virtue theorists were good at was this. The problems, and this is a Wittgensteinian point, the problems that uh, you have are self-created. Your, your own thinking on these problems have created the problems themselves, right? You got so worked up about what it means to follow this principle about don't believe anything upon insufficient evidence, double negative, uh, um, that you've now created a serious situation. And what the virtue, virtue theorist says, a serious situation in terms of now I got conflict between what I'm hearing from authority A and authority B. What the virtue theorist says is this, let's not, let's not give the concepts we use and the concepts we employ in our daily lives a life of their own. Because if we're going to take, say, our, our the, I'll stick with Clifford, it, it, uh, if we're going to take this idea of do not believe anything upon insufficient evidence and we turn it into the kind of supreme standard of epistemology, we've now violated first... Uh, uh, um, we've now, uh, uh, I just, I, I was, I'm mixing my metaphors and I just lost it. Uh, we've now violated things like the first commandment type stuff. We've now created a God out of this epistemological principle itself. And the virtue theorist says, you can't, we can't help but do that when we start philosophizing. This is don't follow vain philosophies. This is Frelhudra. This is all this stuff that, that, you know, why it's so weird that I'm here talking to you now, right? Because we tend to build systems, and then the system takes precedence over what's really, what we really ought to be believing, like God, Christ, and truth. So virtue helps us break some of these barriers down. It refocuses the discussion onto us and the situation that we find ourselves in. So there are these structures out there, and, and the postmodern quagmire has, has shown us that they're all crumbling. Now I'm stuck, and what do I do? What's, how do I move, what's my way forward? Well, what was interesting, and I'll, and I'll bring it back to, to, to Pastor, uh, our readings, if you trace the kind of, uh, at least the Old, and the old, reading, uh, old Testament reading and, and the New Testament reading, so Proverbs and Acts, there was this wonderful uh, uh, hitching point that I'm going to bring out later, I think now, in terms of, of what the Old Testament reading says is, look, I was there, right? How does he say it? He says, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work. This is Proverbs 8, uh, 1 through 4. Uh, sorry, this is at 22. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work. At the first of his acts of, of old, ages ago, I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. And he, and he goes through this. And then in the second reading, we, we're, it's alluded to that this is Christ, right? So I'm there. You know, what's, what's fascinating about this is when one, when one is baptized into Christ, you're baptized into that. You are there. Now, what this does is it allows us as, say, Lutherans to not worry about certain issues in the cultural world. Intelligent design. I dare not go with Old Testament interpretation, right? Some of these problems fall away because if I virtuously push towards Christ and the conversation stays focused on Christ, those questions, because I was baptized into being there through Christ, fall away. I mean, this is this. You guys just caught me in a thinking out loud moment, um, <laughs> because I did, I just read that this morning. I was like, "Ooh, this is good stuff." This is where this is some of the theological link. So the virtue, what the virtue helps us do is it allows us to be human. It allows us to be human with all of that limitation. All right, there are yeah. Come on, bring them. This. Well, let's go. Let's go with Dave because he and then then we'll come forward. Yeah. Uh, 
it seems to me that both you and James are kind of swatting a fly with a cannon here. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is I don't think there's any compelling need to try and adjust our thought to deal with a self-stultifying principle, which it strikes me that, that Clifford's principle is. Never believe anything on insufficient evidence. It's wrong to believe something on insufficient right. evidence. It strikes me that there is insufficient evidence for this claim, <laughs> that it's wrong. To, and, and so the principle is self-stultifying. We don't need to go any farther. I mean, we can go on our merry way just the way we've always been. We don't have to adjust to virtue ethics or right. the will to believe or any of that stuff because Clifford well, gave us a principle we can swat with a fly swatter. Right. So, so sure. And, and, and I think within the academic discourse, that's absolutely correct. I mean, I, I really think, I think this is probably why this, this discussion really hasn't made, made much inroad in larger philosophical talks. I mean, it really is just kind of the sub-discipline within philosophy of religion about three layers down. Um, because it does, it, it, there's not much to do with it. Uh, however, when we want to engage in the public sphere, and that's the you know the the ending the end conversation of my uh, the ending part of my conversation with you guys next week, uh, we have to find a way forward. And I think I think, and again, remember this is the birthing of a research project. I think virtue allows us to at least navigate some of the waters to conversation with with people who are of different authorities and norms, I think, I think. So it, it, you're right, in terms of the kind of theoretical activity, we might be uh, you know, throwing rocks at glass houses or, or, or shooting flies with, with uh, cannons or something like that, right? However, in the more practical discourse that we have and that we must engage in, uh, I, think, I think virtue has some things to offer us. But I'd love to hear your opinion, because this is, this is in your field. This is the stuff that you were looking at, wasn't it? No? OK. <laughs> um, my question, I guess, would be, where do Clifford and James, when talking about something kind of like a Kierkegaard mm -hmm. argument, that you can argue to a certain point, but at some point, there's going to have to be some sort of a leap. And right. you know that I can argue that I got married, and my, I have the evidence to say that my husband has never cheated, but I have no. I have to hope and I have to jump in, fa in faith that my husband will not in the right. future. So it's not just a necessarily a religious discussion, right. but wh where is the space for, for a Kierkegaard kind of leap in? Well, I think, I, think James, I think James is actually working out of that kind of mindset. Uh, and I don't know, because I'm not a William James scholar. I'm just getting into this stuff in terms of I haven't traced his historical roots back, but it wouldn't surprise me in the least to, to see that he was heavily influenced by certain uh, uh, writings of Kierkegaard. Now, for our purposes, and then I'll let me bring this up a bit, uh, I, I, I'm not so much necessary, I'm not interested, I, I don't think, I'm, I don't think I'm interested in necessarily the debate that, that William James and Clifford actually had in terms of, of how these beliefs are formed. I mean, the way this debate has developed in the, in the philosophical literature has to deal with whether or not we actually do control the beliefs that we, the beliefs that we, that we hold. Can, do I have voluntary control over my beliefs? Or do they just kind of come to me uh, 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 um, willy-nilly, and then when I have to make a decision, I make a, a Kierkegaardian leap or I make a Jamesian uh, commitment, right? And so that was their debate. Uh, and I don't want to necessarily engage in that because I, I, don't, I don't know if we'll ever get an answer to the formation of our beliefs. But what I am interested in is what kind of responsible duties do we have what are our responsibilities as humans to the beliefs that we have? Uh, so the idea is we, there's a maintenance issue here. There's a maintenance issue. So I can, I can form beliefs according to a, a, a Jamesian commitment or a Kierkegaardian leap, but that doesn't absolve me of a moral commitment to kind of investigate those, right? I mean, it, it's true that we marry the people we marry, but it really isn't a leap. I mean, we've dated, we, we, we've... we've we, we, we know enough about this person that we feel comfortable taking that leap, right? It's an educated choice. And I think, and, and I think virtue, and virtue has this really strong component of education in it. And so I think, I mean, I think this, is, this is key. Uh, one way we might cash the problem out is, is we've just forgotten how to think. 
We've gotten so used, we've gotten so used to, be given, to, be, to being given the rules that we say, okay, well, I, 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 James, Clifford, that's how I think. Oh, it doesn't fit this model, doesn't fit this model. But that's not really thinking through the issue. That's being a follower. And so I think virtue has, this is where virtue, I think, has something to say to this. Well, I was thinking when you're talking about James after um, talking about Clifford, and you had the, the premise that the immorality doesn't occur with the outcome. It occurs with the premise that you were willing to let that right. boat go out. And recently, <coughs> we had a discussion with somebody of a more evangelical... Well, actually, we are just thinking about what they were thinking, the evangelicals. It seems like that's more of a James thing, where everything is okay as long as it's okay for you. And it works for you. And it's almost like there's no conversation between the two. Right. I was... Um, to be more... Um, for instance, we were talking about baptism. We think baptism saves. We know baptism saves. But if your baptism is just something you do to make your little plot land happy, and as you live through that baptism and you say, I've made that decision for God, there's really no comfort in it. Mm -hmm. The comfort for us comes from the promise that God gives in the baptismal waters. Right. So, so to me, there's a huge... Um, valley between those two and there's almost no discussion. That's right. And, and, that's, and that's, what, that's what's happened with the, I mean, so if you, the way you might cash this out and on the flip side of that is Lutherans and the way I think the evangelical might view the Lutheran is going to be the more Clifford. Right. Now where Clifford's going to say, well, the evidence I'm looking to is, uh, uh, is evidence uh, in the world. I mean, he was a science, mathemati mathematical scientist, right? So he's looking for evidence that way. That's what he had conceived of it. The Lutheran always resorts back to scripture, which is great. But then you hear the evangelical comes at and he says, well, why are you just quoting scripture at me? Don't you live this life or something? You know, I mean, and they always come at us that way. So the, the issue and what God is interested in virtue in the first place is, okay, you're right. You've identified that there's this valley. Theoretically, this valley is because we've constructed this philosophical system around our sides. How do we converse in the middle ground? Where does the conversation take place, right? And I can, I can sit in my tower and throw rocks and you can sit in your tower and throw rocks, and what good does that get us? Nothing. Because I'm more concerned with baptizing somebody into this. That's my concern. I don't want to win the fight. I win if somebody uh, can, at least can conceptually take into consideration once in their life the claims of Christ. That's a, that's a win. And Dave's given me the stop. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back and finish up with virtue and how it relates to apologetics uh, next Sunday.